Okay, good morning. Thank you all for joining us today. And my name is John Domus and I'm the director of the Michigan Chemistry Council. Welcome to this webinar in our synthesis series, uh, an informative webinar in industrial site development, funding, environmental, and logistics. Today's webinar is presented and sponsored by our tremendous partners at Fishbeck, a firm that offers expertise in architecture, engineering, and environmental sciences. And this morning's webinar will touch on a number of various topics in industrial site development, help you understand the impacts of recent trends and new policy developments, and how that impacts your considerations in this area. We're glad to have a, a quartet of expert presenters to share some more. And as an initial housekeeping matter, uh, don't worry, all your lines are on mute. Uh, there's no open cameras either. We will have participation. Uh, first, we will have informative content from our presenters, but then interactive Q&A will follow after that. And you may use either the chat or the Q&A features at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Hope you all are familiar with that by now. Uh, and submit those questions at any time. I always say, don't wait until the end. Um, we can consider and, and adjust the content as we go if there's questions and uh, look forward to having that at the end. This presentation is being recorded. We will share the slides uh, with those who registered after the program and post the recording as soon as it is available. So I'd now like to bring in Jackie Link from Fishback to start things off and introduce the program. Thanks, Jackie. Okay, well, thank you, John, and welcome everyone. I'm Jackie Link, and I've been a member of the Michigan Chemistry Council for 20 years, going back to the days of Andy Such as the director. And I've served as an MCC associate board member since 2005. I wanted to start us out by giving you a little background about Fishbeck. Fishbeck is an employee-owned engineering consulting firm with over 500 employees. Fishbeck has 14 offices across the Midwest. And with our staff from our four divisions, Fishbeck can offer what we call all-in-one services for our clients. I'm the director of the Environmental Management Group where we focus primarily on environmental compliance and permitting. I've asked Danielle, Tony, and Steve from our infrastructure division to provide some insights on industrial site development. Danielle Yoon leads the grant writing effort for Fishbeck and has worked closely with communities and industries to develop and submit numerous grant and loan applications at both the state and federal level. Tony Morand is the director of engineering working in our site development group here at Fishbeck. He's been working with industrial, manufacturing, distribution, commercial and municipal clients at Fishbeck for over 25 years. Steve is a senior project manager with our civil group and has over 30 years of transportation and industrial experience. So Danielle will start us out and show us where to find the money. Perfect, thank you, Jackie. We can go on to the next slide. I'm going to start us off with a brief discussion on policy. A lot of funding flows through the federal government and whenever we have a change in administration that can really affect the dollars that we see as end users. And President Biden has recently released the details on the American Jobs Plan. And that's his proposal for addressing infrastructure needs. Now I'm just going to cover some of the most basic aspects of the plan and I'll share a few subcategories that might be of interest to this group. But whenever we look at a plan like this, it's a good indication of policy and funding changes that might be coming down the pipeline. But we do need to keep in mind that, you know, this is the government, so this will be going through weeks or months of negotiations before it's even debated on the floor. So changes are inevitable. Now I've heard different numbers between two and three trillion dollars for this plan, but the plan seems to include approximately 2.25 trillion dollars in incentives, plus an additional 400 billion dollars in clean energy tax credits. So that brings us to a total of 2.65 trillion dollars. I think it's really helpful to consider this funding as three different buckets that you can see here on the screen. So starting with the bucket all the way to the left, we have transportation with 
$621 billion. This would include some traditional investments that we'd expect for transportation, like roads and bridges, but also some funding for things like railways, disaster resilience, and waterways and ports. Then in the second bucket, we have buildings and utilities with a total of $639 billion. This has a whole list of activities that fall into this bucket, but it includes things like electric and clean energy and funding for our water systems. Then when we look at the third and last bucket of jobs and innovation, we see that that has a whopping $990 billion. And that's big investments in American clean energy and manufacturing. and includes funding for things like workforce development, semiconductor manufacturing research and supply chain support. Next. Okay, so now we're gonna move on and talk about in general, some activities that can be funded. And I see that a majority of our audience today appears to be from the private sector, but you do still have options for funding. A lot of companies are surprised to hear that and we're happy to share that good news that that option is out there. We know that you have more needs than you do money. So I'd like to just go over a few examples of activities that might be able to be funded. And hopefully this will give you some ideas for the future as you consider your projects. On the slide here, you can see we have things like job force training, developing workforce training facilities, public infrastructure, Maybe you need to extend a water main or a road to get to your site. Then we have things like equipment, industrial parks, high-tech shipping and logistics facilities, and mitigating contamination. And that's a really great one to point out because we have a very highly acclaimed environmental group here at Fishback. And that includes a team that specializes in brownfields and remediation. And we're very fortunate to have not one, but two previous Brownfield coordinators from Eagle that are now on our Fishback team and here to help our clients. Some of you might even recognize their names. We have Susan Wenslick. She was working with the Cadillac District while she was at Eagle and Roman Wilson, who was working with the Grand Rapids District. Next. Okay, so now that we've just covered very briefly a few things that can be funded. I'd like to go over some examples and we're gonna focus specifically on some examples from Michigan. But some of the programs that I'm just gonna mention, keep in mind that other states have very similar programs. And that's a nice thing about Fishback is we can really translate across state boundaries. So no matter where your project's located, we can always look for funding for you. So I'm going to start on the upper right side there, looking at the Consumers Energy Solar Gardens in Cadillac. This site was known as the former Mitchell Bentley, and it had a really long manufacturing history. They made everything from wood flooring to auto parts on this site. But after the facility was closed in about the late 1980s, all of these obsolete factory buildings were just left to decay on the site. And then in 2013, there was a fire that left a lot of the buildings half burned and debris across the site. By this point, the city of Cadillac was actually the property owner. So they partnered with the Cadillac Industrial Fund and the Cadillac Brownfield Redevelopment Authority and talked to Consumers Energy and worked to redevelop four acres of the site into a solar garden. But when they did environmental investigations, they did find that the soil and the groundwater were contaminated from those manufacturing uses. And a lot of the building debris that were left on site contained asbestos. So Fishback was pulled on board and we were asked to prepare an Eagle Brownfield redevelopment grant that resulted in grant and loan dollars to pay for that environmental cleanup the building demolition and the removal of those contaminated debris. So then looking at our second example below that, we're gonna look at Midwest Energy Cooperative and they purchased 500 acres of land that you can see there on that map. And that was located in Cass County. 
and they were interested in attracting an agricultural manufacturing facility specifically to the portion of the land that was zoned as industrial. So they asked Fishbeck to prepare a rural development fund grant application through MDARD, the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. And they were looking for funding that was going to let them create an infrastructure development plan. And that was going to essentially outline the steps necessary for them to develop a build ready or a shovel ready site in order to att attract that end user. And actually since the time that we completed that application, which was a few years ago now, MEDC has actually come out with a funding opportunity that's directly related to that type of work. So looking at any kind of activity that goes towards making industrial sites build ready or shovel ready. And then looking at our third and last example, it's with Matern North America and their plant located in Traverse City. Those of you who have kids, you probably recognize this little image. They make the go-go squeeze products. They actually have a sister plant in Idaho and they compete for the market volume that's here in North America. The Idaho plant had received this whole list of incentives from the state and that was making their production costs lower. So they were winning more of this market volume. So one of the projects that the Traverse City had, location had planned was constructing a solar array in order to provide off the grid power for about 60 to 90% of their needs. And they were hoping this would lower their production costs so they'd be more competitive. So they asked Fishbeck to prepare an MDARD rural development grant application, which is the same um, application that I just mentioned for the last project. And then our Brownfield team also helped Matern look into potential brownfield funding, tax abatements, and TIF, which is tax increment financing. So we were really trying to look at a whole host of ways that we could help them lower their production costs. And in the future, Matern is considering partnering with MEDC as they have a few production lines they'd like to put back into operation. So paying for that equipment costs when there's jobs that will be created. Next slide. Okay, now as I wrap up and before I pass it off to Tony, I'd just like to touch on some of the funding strategies that we like to use in order to maximize your funding. The first is the relationships that we maintain. That's with funding agencies and also with municipalities. Some funding opportunities aren't directly available to you as a for-profit company. So creating those partnerships with local municipalities is really important so that you can hopefully have the money flow through them to you. Then the next on the list is foundation directory subscriptions. I didn't really cover this in any of the earlier slides, but foundations can be just another funding source that you can leverage. But the problem is it's really difficult to find any of these opportunities with foundations when you're just doing an online search. So what Fishbeck does is we pay for a subscription to groups like the Foundation Directory Online and Michigan Grant Watch so that we'll be ready to search those databases when you come to us with a project in mind. The third strategy we use is a familiarity with applications and a knowledge of what makes an application successful. And if we bring multiple opportunities for funding to you, we can help you compare those opportunities by looking at some metrics like how available is the funding? You know, is it very competitive? What are the timelines and do those match up with what you have envisioned? Are there any matching costs? Are there any, you know, what are the loan terms in comparison to each other? And then finally, you know, Jackie has mentioned this, but we do operate as a full service firm. And what that does is it creates engagement between our funding department and all of our other specialties. And although I do head up our funding efforts at Fishback, I am a professional engineer. So I'm able to bring that technical experience to the table when I'm crafting applications. 
And that makes it especially easy when I'm communicating with people like Steve or Tony and we're working to find the best funding opportunity for you. And so with that, I will hand it over to Tony. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for this morning's presentation, we've picked out a few topics related to the site development that we think you might find interesting and topics that seem to be getting the most uh, attention and discussion with our clients these days. So real quickly, we're gonna hit on traffic and site access, employee parking lots, pedestrian access and safety, site security, stormwater management, government relations, and finally project planning. I'm gonna start with a couple of stories from one of our longstanding clients, which is Bradford White. Uh, they are the US's largest manufacturer of water heaters and they're located in Middleville, Michigan. About 10 years ago, they started a plan to substantially increase their production rates that would ultimately involve adding substantial square footage and employees to their existing facility, all while they kept their existing production rates uh, online. One situation they had on their site that they knew was not right was the fact that all of their incoming and outgoing trucks had to come through the main parking lot to get to their destinations. <clears throat> they knew this wasn't safe for the employees walking or for the employees parking. So the first item they addressed was adding a new 100,000 square foot distribution building on the top, uh, north is up on the north end of the site <clears throat> and uh, built an access drive from the street to the north into the back of the facility, which is that yellow arrow uh, pointing there to that access drive. This freed up a lot of valuable space in the employee lot for additional parking and it also improved an unsafe situation with the trucks, cars and pedestrians trying to share the same space. This also allowed Bradford White to set up a secure guarded entry for all their trucks for screening of the trucks before they come onto the site or leave the site. The next thing that we did was to purchase multiple pieces of property on the east side of the site there that allowed expansion of the employee lots. But uh, as it, it, additionally, <clears throat> they uh, added a driveway, which is that blue arrow pointing to that north driveway. This, this additional driveway solved a huge traffic problem that they had previously with just one entry and exit the traffic would back up both on the site and off the site at shift changes and it was it was a terrible mess. So by adding this north drive they were able to separate traffic coming and going from the north and traffic coming and going from the south and it's just made an amazing difference. <clears throat> it seems to me that industrial businesses are frequently at a loss as to just how many parking spaces they really need. Multiple shifts and constant change in the growth of the shifts make it challenging to know what the right answer is, other than usually we don't have enough parking. We've assisted many of our industrial clients using our drone cameras, drone survey equipment, traffic counting equipment to help look at the timing of employees coming and going from the site to help us better understand how many spaces are currently needed and once you know that, then it's a lot easier to plan for the future to know what your future goal should be. Next slide. <clears throat> I just wanna mention quickly that some clients are either implementing or thinking about implementing electric fleet vehicles. If this is something that your company is thinking about, the sooner you start this conversation, the better. There's a lot of details to consider in determining how and where the charging of these vehicles will take place, where the infrastructure needed for that is located. This equipment can be bulky and the power needed is significant depending on how many vehicles you're considering. <clears throat> 
Um, we've also been installing a lot of rideshare drop-off areas with weather shelters for clients. Um, there are two things. They're recognizing that this is something that's just more popular. And secondly, they're trying to encourage public transportation and ride sharing. So this is really becoming popular in some areas with some age groups. Uh, <clears throat> these things uh, do solve the problem of cars stopping in strange places with people jumping into traffic unexpectedly but you, it, you do wanna find the right location for these things on your site that minimizes traffic conflicts and encourages their use ultimately. My colleague, Steve, was gonna talk a minute here, assisted Owens Corning with installation of solar panels uh, in their parking lot over the top of their parked vehicles. This solar array, solar array did a few things. It provided 30% of the power needed for the Owens Corning World Headquarters, covering uh, 1,400 employee vehicles from the rain and birds and stuff like that. And it reduced the amount of water that needed, rainwater that needed to be treated since this stormwater uh, never reaches the ground. <clears throat> Steve, uh, successfully convinced the planning commission that the water hitting this system uh, didn't need to be treated and was fear of free of impurities, sorry. Finally, on the right there, there's a picture of a card reader and a gate. This was installed uh, to prevent the general public from using, I'm sorry, that picture's in the middle now. Um, to prevent the public from using the parking lot and also keep a record of who is on site at all times to help with their emergency response programs. <clears throat> the next topic I'd like to mention is pedestrian safety. We all know how chaotic it is with hundreds of employees leaving the site at the same time after working a long shift. While we've been working with Amazon, we've learned quite a bit of that First of all, they're very serious about keeping their employees as safe as they can. They actually took the time and effort to create a site safety memo um, for safety items to be implemented on all of their existing and future sites. And they keep that memo up to date with updates from time to time. <clears throat> A few of the things that Amazon requires on their sites is multiple dedicated walkways to keep pedestrians out of the drive lanes. You can see this is a, a sidewalk that's separated from, from the main driveways. Um, they also install these short fences that you hopefully can see they're a four foot PVC black coated fence. They put these fences in strategic locations to prevent jaywalking and ultimately push people into the pedestrian walkways that where they want them to be located. At the crosswalks, uh, at the drive aisles, they also install speed bumps. <clears throat> uh, and these signs you see stop for pedestrians to slow traffic down. They also have uh, a, a part of their design considerations, enhanced site lighting to improve the whole lighting of the site for visibility and safety. Site security has also been a hot topic with a lot of clients lately, but this is something that I know this group has been doing for years and probably has the best handle on of anybody, but sadly, Recent, recent events in the news have prompted some employers to consider um, if they haven't already moving their security checkpoint out of the building and away from the building. A lot of people have been adding security cameras to the parking lots, adding emergency pedestrian phones throughout the parking lot, and uh, finally guarded entry for receiving and shipping. I just wanted to mention one thing on this topic of stormwater management. <clears throat> As you all are likely aware of, the 
Clean Water Act has required many municipalities to improve their stormwater discharges. So which in turn they've passed on that requirement down to industry and, and businesses. <clears throat> well, in the past, you know, primary focus was on flood control. Now the new regulations are all about stream protection and water quality. There's, there's simply a, a, a plethora of manufacturers and products on the market that are seizing on this opportunity. We've tried a number of them. I just wanted to mention that personally, I like these contact units. They seem to work really well. They're easy to monitor and easy to maintain and clean out. Another topic that I think is really important and uh, has already been mentioned is government relations. Um, having a good relationship with your local municipality, especially during times of growth, when you're going to be asking for rezoning or permitting approvals uh, can be critical. Having, <clears throat> having folks a fan of community development growth and jobs, <clears throat> they, they want to see you succeed. I wanna suggest that maybe you consider inviting some of these people to your facility to show them what you do, get them familiar with your team, what improvements you might be considering, uh, informal lunches from time to time to keep them up to date. This also allows you to get some feedback from them on what they're seeing and hearing about your business that might allow you to address certain situations before they potentially get brought up in public discussions when you're asking for approvals for some of your new projects. Uh, the last slide for me, I just wanna say a word about project planning. <clears throat> uh, in my experience, too often it seems like individual departments are working on solutions to specific challenges that they have, and they might not understand the impa impacts that their choices are having on other departments within the company. Um, while it is a commitment of time, I do believe that working as a group saves time in the long run and cost. <clears throat> During the project planning processes, consider having all of your departments represented along with your consulting engineers and specialty contractors. More times than not, better ideas come from teamwork and group discussion. With that, I'll pass it over to Steve. Thanks, Tony. Before uh, before I get going with uh, my portion of the presentation here, I thought it was important to uh, to talk about the definition of logistics. Uh, logistics is a term that I think all of us are familiar with. Uh, however, many uh, probably have different interpretations. Um, I like a definition uh, that I found here uh, recently, which uh, is the management of the flow of things between their point of origin and the point of consumption to meet the requirements of a specific customer or corporation. This aerial image here is a project that I, I completed about two years ago. It's the Ironville Intermodal Facility for the Toledo Port. And um, <clears throat> I wanna give full credit to, uh, to Midwest Terminals that's the operator for, uh, for this photo and a couple others you'll see in the presentation. Um, as you'll uh, as you'll hear here, this is a secure facility, and uh, drone cameras and things like that that we talked about before uh, would not uh, would not have been um, a, a uh, welcome addition to uh, to this location. But the uh, the photograph here, I think, touches on many of the services that uh, that Fishback offers. I wanted to just go through and highlight a few of them to. Uh, indicate the complexities of this job. Um, you know, brownfield redevelopment, uh, wetland mitigations. Uh, we had all modes of, uh, of transportation with the exception of, of air. Uh, we had truck scales, conveyor systems. Uh, the, the site, as I mentioned, was um, under security provisions by the US Coast Guard. Uh, the medium voltage power distribution 
uh, specialty fire response for uh, some explosive gases that were being transloaded, as well as fall protection, access management, public infrastructure systems, and as Tony alluded before, um, government relations that I possessed um, with the community uh, was able to garner site plan approval and, and zoning variances. Next, Jackie. We're going to focus today uh, on the truck and the rail aspects of logistics. Um, although uh, water and pipeline obviously are, are also very critical to uh, many of the projects and customers that we work with. Uh, there on the right side are examples of a few of the jobs that I've completed here recently. Uh, the upper left picture, uh, typical outbound um, truck docks. Um, that's a flush dock. Uh, that um, allowed for forklift traffic for this injection molding company to uh, to load the trucks. And th this company actually, they have um, 26 bays and they actually utilize the, the trucks not only for uh, the loading of the outbound product, but in some cases for additional storage. The um, picture to the upper right is a an open gated, um, or open access facility for a food processing company that we possess. Uh, Norfolk Southern is the main line uh, there on the right side of the photograph with um, an industrial siding and spur track leading into the plant. Uh, this customer was, was responding to some of the uh, rail challenges that many of our customers are dealing with right now, which I'll talk, uh, talk about in a few minutes. Um, but what this customer is is looking to do as part of a plant expansion, they also are using this industrial spur track to uh, assist in the movement of their product between plants as well as um, as outbound onto the main line for shipment. Down below are um, are the a uh, example of a Great Lakes uh, self unloading freighter. Uh, I have done a, a number of bulk uh, material uh, handling projects, and this is a, an example here of the freighter unloading to a receiving hopper and conveyor system um, that um, this specific one was unloading uh, limestone ballast. In the lower right is a, a picture of um, a pipeline. That's a project that uh, I was, I was uh, completed on which is in Western Pennsylvania as part of the fracking and, and uh, drilling operations that are going on in Western PA and, and Southeast Ohio. And this specific um, photograph is indicating or uh, illustrates a transload operation from uh, large 100,000 barrel tanks, which I'll show you um, in a few minutes here, some additional tanks that they had on site, but also transloaded from the tanks to either truck or rail uh, through that operation. Next slide, Jackie. So when we talk about truck, um, many of the, the same aspects that Tony covered with the employees and the site circulation apply um, in the truck area as well. But one of the important distinctions uh, is whether you have an in-house fleet or, or you're gonna have a, a contracted fleet or maybe a combination of the two. Um, in some instances, how, uh, how your, your truck shipping, both inbound and outbound of your plant, uh, will, will dictate some of the design criteria that you may wanna utilize. The picture on the upper right is a photograph of, a, uh, of the entry that um, Pilkington, uh, now known as NSG after an acquisition, um, has here in Northwest Ohio. Um, in that instance, they, they actually have a double lane entry at this, at this entrance. Um, on the far right, uh, there's a card reader and automatic gate, which um, many of the routine deliveries and um, in-house truckers, uh, they'll have badges that they can uh, swipe on the card reader and in addition to opening the gate, um, also records the name, uh, the representative company, uh, the um, how long they're permitted to stay on site, 
as well as what they uh, what they typically are hauling uh, into the location. On the uh, on the left side of the picture is a uh, is where the uh, I'll say the more infrequent or unexpected deliveries or visitors to the plant may occur. And um, they stop at the stop sign there and a guard um, comes out uh, similar to what Tony described before, records all the same information and also uh, makes a call to, uh, to the individual um, that's responsible for their arrival uh, to maintain the clearance and security on site. With um, with the facility requirements, um, you know, Tony touched a little bit on the on-site circulation. Um, I can't stress that enough, especially in the case of contract shipping, uh, where folks may not be familiar with with your plants and the operational aspects of things. Um, you know, very critical in my opinion to have a, a singular direction of travel and and predictable. Uh, turning movements um, that um, uh, you know provide a lot less decision making and um, and keep the trucks where we want them uh, on the individual sites. Staging is another aspect, not only uh, within the plant but also at these entries. Um, and you'll see kind of in two different examples there in the photographs the the NSG picture. Uh, they're relatively close to the to the public right of way, in the sense that this uh, this entry they receive uh, very infrequent deliveries, um, and so their their volume is they don't have many uh, many queues developing here, so it affords them the opportunity to expand their usable space uh, beyond the gate. In the uh, in the picture below, uh, this is a 24-hour um, delivery location. However, the gate is only manned 10 hours per day. And so this client asked, you know, what options would be available to stage the vehicles because they were getting uh, some resistance from the municipality on where these trucks were going to go if they arrived at the gate and the gate was closed. So what we did in this case is off to the left-hand side of the photograph, we have a, a, a long dead-end area that's, um, that it terminates with a cul-de-sac uh, where the trucks can drive in there. They can turn 180 degrees uh, in the cul-de-sac and come back. And in some cases, many of them actually uh, get their prescribed uh, sleeping um, done at that location. And then when the gate opens up in the morning, uh, they're there ready to make their delivery. The other, uh, the other aspect of, uh, of um, truck circulation that I, I see a lot of times, which um, causes some plants some uh, reduction in their throughput capacity is, is orientation of scales, uh, not only where they're sited, uh, but also in the geometry and, and proper, uh, proper consideration for the large turning radii that that are needed from these trucks uh, getting onto and, and off the scales. Um, many in many instances uh, the scales are, are located that makes sense for the site um, but when the when the trucker is looking to to line up and get onto the scale they're very skittish about it because you know maybe they don't know exactly where the back end of their trailer may be, um, or in, in other instances maybe they're they're backing up, um, you know, doing a back and forth movement to try to get lined up before they make the move onto the site or onto the scale. And in either case, uh, all that's doing is slowing down the uh, the circulation of trucks, um, you know, in and out of the site. Next slide, Jackie. So rail, uh, rail is is really classified, um, you know, in in three. I think of rail in three three primary areas: the Class One railroads, uh, which are our CSXs, Norfolk Southern, uh, BNSF, uh, CN, etc. Uh, short lines tend to be 
uh, class two to class five. Um, they, they're more regional in nature or in some cases uh, uh, customer based. Um, and then the third part, which really isn't a locomotive, but I, I put it in this category is what we call pushers. And, and a photograph of a pusher is shown there um, in the upper, upper photograph. Those are, those are really um, intended primarily for moving uh, one or two rail cars around a, around a private site um, after a delivery has been made to the, um, to the facility. Um, you know, the facilities are really classified when we talk about uh, rail as an open facility or a closed gated facility. And the differences, you know, probably are, are fairly obvious to most of you. Um, but the key one that I want to point out is how these two facilities operate with the, with the specific rail companies. An open facility uh, allows delivery of the rail car pretty much whenever, uh, whenever the, the rail provider uh, arrives at the site. That could be day or night. Um, it, it could be in a situation where the facility is open or closed. Um, and it, it, um, it really runs, you know, somewhat unpredictable, um, but in, in certain instances, um, you know, it, it works for the uh, specific operation. In the closed facility, um, these are locations uh, where similar to that intermodal terminal, um, you have strict security, um, whether it be government regulated in the case of that intermodal terminal, or in other cases, it may be that you have a uh, product that's outside or, you know, the general, you want to you uh, prevent the general public from getting onto the facility. So in these, in these gated facilities, uh, what, what is required there is the, the rail company will provide notification to the customer on a delivery, and uh, then the gate is opened up. In other instances, um, there's there's kind of a combination of the two, uh, which some comp some um, of our customers will actually deal with a a situation where there's either uh, cameras or a laser um, set up, which will allow for the gates to be opened automatically uh, on arrival of a rail car. In, in many of these cases, uh, in both the open and the closed facilities, uh, what's happening right now in the, uh, in the industry is a series of charges that specifically the class one railroads are, are applying to our industrial customers in, in somewhat of a unilateral fashion. And they really are, are focusing um, on demerage charges, uh, storage charges, and congestion surcharges. And in all of these instances, uh, the, the customer really doesn't have much to say about them. Um, demerage is, is a fee that is assessed um, if the rail car is uh, unloaded in a time frame uh, that is in excess of what contractually has been specified. Storage, as the name might imply, um, if you're on a if your site is is in a position where you don't have enough room uh, to receive the rail cars that are being delivered, um, then they will assess uh, the class ones will assess the storage fee, and that's primarily based off from the fact that the rail car is either sitting on on an industrial lead track or possibly even on a passing siding down the way. Um, or in, in uh, another case altogether is they may bypass, uh, bypass your facility and, uh, and store the cars down the, down the line further. Congestion is, is another aspect of this where, uh, where things get into play and it's only going to become uh, more critical as um, industrial, um, industrial shipping as well as the passenger, uh, passenger trains uh, continue to expand onto our network. Um, <clears throat> some, of our, some of our customers are addressing these unilateral charges with uh, additional storage track or in some cases storage facilities. Um, they, they also are, are uh, creating a buffering system. Uh, this client right here 
did a combination of both. Uh, they extended that lead track um, to accommodate another five rail cars that doubled their on-site storage capacity. But they also added a couple of those um, storage silos, which allowed them a little bit of, of buffering if they needed to. When you're talking about expansion, uh, especially in the rail environment, uh, two things that I like to um, I like to just uh, you know make sure we consider as we're doing this is the track geometry. Um, track geometry overall, both horizontally and vertically, takes a lot more room than people normally expect, um, and that has a lot to do with the um, the vertical grades that locomotives and those pushers can can navigate, as well as the the horizontal curves that rail cars uh, can easily navigate without uh, without uh, a disrail or um, a disrailment. Um, Clearances. Steve, I just wanted to let you know we got about five minutes left. All right, thank you. That's yep. what happens when you go last, right? <laughs> um, the last part of it is is clearances, clearances both laterally and also vertically to buildings. Next, next slide, Jackie. Um, so Tony, uh, Tony talked about government relations. I wanted to uh, just emphasize that doesn't always uh, or doesn't stop just at the uh, at the planning and zoning and, and municipal uh, government level, but also at the state level and in some cases in the fire and emergency response uh, personnel as well. Uh, this project is that um, that uh, condensate project that I mentioned in Western Pennsylvania, where those are those two tanks, uh, 100,000 barrel tanks that I mentioned. You see in the photograph the red uh, vertical pipe and the and the ring going around the top. That's the that's the fire uh, fire suppression system. The interesting part about this was that at the time that I was going through the design of this project, um, the uh, state of Pennsylvania and Ohio also, for that matter, they had no um, no written provisions in their code for uh, these sorts of facilities as the as the fracking was just coming into into uh, prominence. So with the, the conversations with the fire marshal and, and discussions back and forth, uh, we were able to arrive at a solution that um, was uh, kept the public safe in the general area, uh, but also adapted uh, to our um, needs of our client. Next, Jackie. And I'll wrap up. Uh, we, you know, I've talked here a little bit about on-site related issues, but I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention off-site um, things. Things such as geometrics, uh, low vertical clearance uh, overhead bridges, um, are become extremely problematic um, when you're uh, when you're dealing with truck traffic and and shipments. In one case. Uh, in a uh, in a plant here in Northwest Ohio, um, this ended up adding substantial time uh, to the trucks that were arriving to the plant from the Ohio Turnpike, as uh, it added about a 12 mile route or detour to their um, to their plant because they couldn't get through this overpass. Uh, last thing I'll mention is is on site geometrics and that sort of thing. Um, the um, Picture on the left uh, is the Schutz Container project in or client in Perrysburg, Ohio. Um, not only uh, not only was um, you know did I perform the industrial design work for the warehousing and and the process work of this client, but the relationships that I possessed with the city of Perrysburg allowed us to negotiate an aerial easement um, that allowed their conveyor system to navigate between their two buildings uh, through that enclosed bridge that you see in the photograph. And with that, Jackie, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Um, I just wanted to, on this last side, I just wanted to mention uh, pollution prevention plans. They are required before you receive shipment of oil or other polluting materials at your site. You want to make sure personnel are trained in the event of a spill. Um, this is the Bradford White bulk loading and unloading area, which has sized secondary containment. And the covered truck bay prevents rainwater from collecting in the containment system. And the area is graded, so no runoff does enter into the containment. 
Also transfer hoses are all inside the containment area. So this is an ideal setup. Uh, in my experience, uh, the majority of the reportable releases are during the bulk loading and unloading. So it's important to consider these when you're looking at your designing your facility. Then one other quick thing, um, covering drains in the plant when transferring uh, polluting materials is another good prevention measure um, if you can't eliminate floor drains completely. Um, just remember too, to make sure you have a good mechanical integrity program for your tank farms and are doing your monthly checks on um, pumps and hose connections. So with a good prevention planning, uh, you won't have to worry about notifying agencies and reporting a release. So if you have any other questions on that, feel free to call me. Um, we've got uh, a whole nother pre presentation we could give you on, the, on that topic. <laughs> so with that, um, John, I'm not sure if we have any uh, questions for our presenters. And this last slide has our contact information, which please feel free to reach out to any of our speakers, uh, email them directly if you have any specific questions. And we really appreciate you joining us today. And um, I'll let John take it away with the, any questions for our speakers. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you for everyone um, who uh, shared a lot of interesting um, updates here and a lot of things I think uh, potentially learn more about. So I want to remind everybody, please uh, put any questions into the Q&A or chat. We've got about uh, eight minutes here. I think one question that comes up often from members um, is about rail. And I know that the rail industry is moving in a direction where they are becoming more efficient and uh, you know, helps their bottom line, but also requires their customers to meet a lot of kind of performance um, and service uh, standards. Um, and I think the word was unilateral uh, from Steve. So um, how would you best engage your class one rail on proposed plan expansion? And how would you work with them to maybe uh, get their attention and address some of the issues that you might be facing. Thanks, John. I guess, Jackie, I'll feel that one. Um, overall, I think the, the way I would summarize this, John, would be um, upfront communication. Um, and one of the things uh, where I've found um, this to be very successful is knowing the people. Um, you know, I think with all of our all of our businesses, um, you know, the interpersonal relationships that you share um, greatly helps in, in expediting and, and um, improving the communications. Um, and that's, uh, that's where I've been very successful here in the industrial market over my career is, is establishing the relationships, not only with the design, um, the design people in, in the case of Jacksonville for CSX or Atlanta for um, the Norfolk Southern folks uh, as our primary class ones, um, but also um, with the, the state uh, representatives and their industrial development team. Um, many times uh, it really is a, a situation where our clients are, are maybe not familiar with exactly what vocabulary to ask or, or what the issues may be with the railroad. And so initial discussion kind of gets off on the wrong foot. Um, and that's where I can serve as a, as a moderator in that case, knowing the needs of our customers and what the end goal is and present the questions in a, um, in a fashion that is a little more, um, palatable to the to, to the rail companies so that's that's my uh, my number one tip i would suggest gotcha and i would assume also if you start factoring in some of those things like demerge charges and others um maybe making these uh logistics upgrades suddenly becomes a lot more uh attractive uh when you factor in um some of those avoided costs very much so, and and I think the other thing that that is is related to the demerages and, and those sorts of uh, those sorts of charges is that, you know, I truly believe that the rail company does not want to charge those, um, but what they're really um, what their private customers are are uh, 
really forcing upon them is better and timeliness of delivery. And so what they're, what they're trying to do with, with the demerit or with the storage fees are, you know, it's, it's kind of somewhat of a punitive uh, type of approach, but I don't really believe that they want to do it. What they're trying to do is, is come up with a system where they can respond to the myriad of their customers on a more timely basis. I mean, we've all, we've all experienced, uh, you know, a rail delivery that we thought was coming today ends up coming next week. And, and they're, you know, the, the private uh, operational people that I talk with, they are perfectly aware of, of that aspect of things and the, and the uh, demands that their customers are making on them. And they're trying to respond within the constraints that they have as well. Absolutely. Um, next question, I think dealing with uh, water quality. So whether that's Jackie or, or Tony or whoever, um, I know there's some discussion about some of these mechanical water quality structures. And again, going to what the direction is probably going on water quality standards and enforcement, uh, both at the federal state level, uh, start talking some of these things being more uh, of an imperative. Uh, can you talk more about these uh, solutions, how they operate and, and how you know, effective and, and uh, maintenance free they might be? I assume that's me, Jackie. <laughs> well, nothing is maintenance free, that's for sure. Um, but what we have noticed is uh, the maintenance schedule varies a lot depending on the end user and you know how much sand and gravel they might have on their site, how clean their sites are. So the maintenance programs take a little bit to figure out, you know, you just monitor things during the first year maybe and then once once you've once you've done that you can kind of figure out how frequently uh, these things need to be maintained um, the, the the devices that I showed are I like them because they're concrete and stainless steel and they don't really require a lot of maintenance in themselves the maintenance is just simply removing the uh, floatables or sediments or hydrocarbons whatever is captured inside of those things uh, and again, another reason I like them is because they have multiple openings that you can quickly pop open and, and observe what's going on and stick a pumper uh, truck straight down into those openings and, and pump them out rather quickly. So um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think that's a great answer, Tony. And I, I just wanted to add to that, um, Doing so, I do a lot of SPCC inspections, and um, besides, you know, this is for stormwater management. Uh, what Tony had shown, um, but a lot of people do have oil water separators also, and and like Tony said, you really need to understand the frequency uh, and how much builds up, and so it is important when you first install them to schedule like a um, an initial frequency of maybe one or two months, just to kind of get an idea of how quickly these things are filling up and, uh, and then set up your maintenance schedule accordingly. Great, thank you. Um, and then last question, just on funding. Um, I mean, Danielle teased us a little bit with uh, some of this federal funding that may or may not be coming and what that looks like. Um, whether you're, you're looking at, at something like that coming for, for infrastructure or just in general, what's the right time to st start top funding or applying for a grant? And uh, how, would, how would you go about it? Yeah, so as far as the, the right time goes, earlier in the process is definitely ideal. Um, if any of you have ever worked with state or federal funding agencies before, you know that their timelines can be a little bit restrictive and they might not line up the best with what you already have you know, in the works or moving. So getting involved earlier in the planning process is good. But with that being said, I think it's always worth reaching out. Sometimes things can still work even if you're partway through a project. And even if that isn't a good fit, maybe it'll give you an idea for an upcoming project. And then in terms of how you can go about it, that's 
that part's pretty easy. Um, my contact information is here. So I'd really encourage you to give me a call or shoot me an email if you have a project that you wanna talk about funding. Um, I can gather some initial information talking to you and then we can actually do what we call an initial funding consultation. And that's where we really just try and uncover, you know, all the all the rocks and just try and find any potential funding sources that might be a good fit. And then we would go over this list with you before we really dive deep into any of them and move on to the, the final application process. Great. Well, appreciate that and appreciate uh, again having someone who knows where the money is. That's uh, always a key part of any project. So unless there's any other questions. Um, Folks want to put the Q&A or, or uh, chat uh, again, uh, their contact information for any of the Fishback uh, presenters is on the screen. We will be providing the slides as a recap and making the recording available later. So appreciate everyone for joining us today. Thank you for your interest in this topic and thank you for your participation in our Catalyst series and look for um, further announcements about uh, programs to come. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you, John. And thanks everybody else for putting together the slides today at